Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me today. I really appreciate the, uh, the invitation and the pleasure it is to be here to worship with you today. Uh, before I go any further, let's just pray one more time. Father, it's a privilege to, to worship you today, this day of rest that you've given us. And I pray just for this moment in time that your spirit be here, that you still our thoughts and our hearts, and that we can be in your presence today. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. My sermon today, Forgive Yourself, you know, it's not something we talk about a lot. When we, when we hear sermons about forgiveness, it's often about the forgiveness of God or it's about the way that we should perhaps forgive each other. But today I want to talk about forgiving yourself and maybe you're a bit concerned that sounds a bit new age, Pastor. Forgiving yourself, that sounds like it's one of those things you see in a, in a self-help section in the bookshop how to forgive yourself. So I'm trying to provoke you just a little to get your interest and I hope by the end of the sermon you'll see why I've titled this. And I'm going to start off just with a little silly story about me. So you get to know me a little better, but, you know, it's not a, not a story that's going to leave me in a flattering light, so please be compassionate today as I, as I share a little bit about me. And I'm going to start with a story... Uh, about a pool party. Who's ever been to a pool party? Am I, oh, okay, a few people, good on you. Do, do they still have pool parties? Is that still a thing? I don't know. Where I grew up in Broken Hill in the 70s, that were definitely a thing because we were far, far away from the ocean. And so pool parties, if your friend had a swimming pool, they were the most popular kid in the class. And so I, I used to go to my friend's house for, for pool parties. As we got older... The nature of the pool parties kind of changed because it wasn't just the boys anymore. Girls got invited as well, and that changed the, the tone of the pool party. Uh, and I just want to share a story. One day we were playing around, as friends do. We were playing chasey. You remember chasey, right, when you would just chase each other around? Except we'd gotten to an age where if you managed to catch someone, and I blush to say this, you could claim a kiss from them. Scandalous, isn't it? You know, I look back now at those times and I compare them today and I think, how innocent were we, right? But we were playing this game and this particular time, this girl who was a very dear friend of mine decided to catch me. The problem was I didn't want her to catch me at all. I didn't want her to claim any prize at all from me. Luckily, I was faster and I would run away and I remember vividly turning back and, and teasing her about it and how I didn't want her to catch me. I remember being actually quite cruel in some of the things that I said to her and I could see that they hurt her when I said those things. And, you know, being a young teenage boy, I, I tried to shrug it off and, and just move past it. But as I went through life and I grew older and matured a little, this memory of that moment kept coming back to me like a stone stuck in my shoe. For some reason, it kept niggling at me. And I'd left home to go to boarding school by this, by this time. I'd lost touch with this girl. And it just sort of stuck with me, this feeling of guilt, this regret that I, that I had. And I'm sure I'm not alone in having regrets. All of us have regrets in our life. And something I've noticed as I get older, and when I say hello to my old friends, I notice we're all a little greyer. I seem to have more regrets as I get older. I think back about mistakes that I've made, things that I've said, whether they're intentional or not, that may have hurt someone, I've got inscribed in my memory. Maybe, you know, you can relate to that. Maybe you've got your own regrets. When I became a parent, boy, a whole new host of regrets came along. I should have done that better. I should have done that. I didn't raise her right. I should have made her go to bed earlier. These things swirl around in your head. And all of a sudden, I started waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning and these regrets would start invading my mind. And I would toss and turn in bed thinking about the things that I had done. Maybe you are thinking about those things as well. 
Maybe you're one of those people who just sleeps all the night through with a clean conscience. But I, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say most of us have some regrets in our lives, things that we wish we could change, take back, do over, and they're hanging around with us. Now, when I came out of the Catholic Church and I met this wonderful lady who I'd eventually marry and I began doing studies uh, with an Adventist pastor, we came across this Bible verse. I'm going to read it out. If you'd like, feel free to read it with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Purify or cleanse us is probably a version that you've heard before. Who knows this Bible verse? Does, does everyone know it? Maybe it's a favourite of yours as well. It's a favourite of mine. Do you believe it? Maybe? You know, I, I think about that a lot. I believe this verse, but if I believe this verse, why am I still carrying all of this regret and guilt? Because if I really believe that God had cleansed me, that God had said, I will purify you, why have I refused to let the weight of my regrets and guilt go? Is it because God is not faithful and just? No. Is it because God said he'll only cleanse us from some of our unrighteousness? No. No. The fault is me and my faith in not believing that God could actually forgive the things that I do not forgive myself of. And I'm going to look at that today through the eyes of two men in the Bible by contrasting their experience of the same event and look at its aftermath through their eyes. The first story we're going to look at today is that of Peter. Now, can I just see, is there anyone here called Peter? There's a Peter here. So if I ask who knows a Peter? Everyone, we all know someone called Peter, right? Peter's a very popular name. And uh, when you go to Jerusalem and you get a tour through Jerusalem, one of the highlights is a place where the story of Peter figures very prominently. And it's here. It's on the eastern side of Mount Zion. Mount Zion is it's a, it's a hill. It's not a huge mountain. It's one of the hills that Jerusalem is built on. And when you get a tour through Jerusalem, you go here. And I went there in 2007 and took these photos of the house. It's actually a, a cathedral there now. On, and it's on the site where they believe Caiaphas lived, the house of the high priest. And you know, when you go to the Holy Lands, there are some sites that are going, oh, maybe, it could be. But archaeologically, this site is very much true. They, they all agree, all the experts say, yes, we believe this is the house where Caiaphas lived. Now, of course, the house isn't there any longer. There's a church built on top of the site. And that's true of everywhere you go in the Holy Lands around Israel. Wherever Jesus did anything, someone has put a cathedral on top of it. Uh, <laughs> and I mean everywhere. Uh, you go to Capernaum and you find the house of Peter, there's a cathedral on top of it. But they've got a glass floor so you can look down into where Peter used to live. That's what it's like. So you go, you go down the hill here, to this cathedral and interestingly there is still a few things left from the time of Caiaphas. There's this stairway sort of around the side and the experts think yes this is probably old enough to have been around when Jesus was alive at the house of Caiaphas. But most interestingly is that underneath this cathedral and carved into the sandstone rock that is Mount Zion is an empty cell. And they believe this is where prisoners were kept when they were brought to the house of Caiaphas. And when you go here, and we did, there's a little stand with a Bible on it, and carved into all of the walls around are these crosses. And they were carved by the crusaders who went to Jerusalem and found this site. It's an incredible place to visit because this is very likely where Jesus spent some of the time when he was in the house of Caiaphas. And we know a little bit about that story because of this. And this statue is just outside of the church there at this house. And in the statue, there's Peter 
and there are three servants, and at the top is a rooster. And the church itself is called the Church of St. Peter in Galicantu. Galicantu meaning cock crow. And that's the story that we're looking at. Jesus was arrested on that fateful night. And I'll have some of the verses up, most of them will be up, but feel free to follow along in your Bible if you like. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had gathered together. Peter followed from a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest's house. He ran into the courtyard and sat down with the guards to see how it would all come out. And I wonder what you have in your mind when you hear the word courtyard. Have you seen some of the movies of the recreation of this moment? And they seem like it's a vast area. But having been to this, to this spot now, it was not big. It was, the courtyard would be smaller than this church. And so Peter would have been very obvious where he was. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway. You can tell Peter's a bit worried. He's backing off. He went to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Three times he is accused, three times he is denying it. Immediately a rooster crowed and then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Only hours before, at their final supper together, Jesus had told Peter this would happen. And it did. And how is Peter, what's his reaction? He weeps bitterly. He's come to a turning point in his life. This isn't the Peter we're used to seeing, right? We see Peter as this brash, confident disciple, always putting himself forward, wanting to be first. Now he's broken. He's betrayed someone that he loves. He's having a crisis of faith. He's convicted. He's done something wrong. I wonder if you've ever had that experience in your life yourself. A bitter moment. You know, often we kind of do things if we can get away with them. It's not until we're confronted with the result of our betrayal of our sin that it really hits us, the consequences of what we've done. I remember being a, a university student in Canberra and my parents, you know, they, they gave as much money as they could to support me, but eventually they, they had to stop. And so I, I tried to support myself. I tried to get a job. And in the meantime, I had to sell things that I owned. And all I owned was books because I love to read. I had a lot of books. So I would take my books to the secondhand bookstore. I'd sell four or five and I'd get $10 and I'd go buy some, some food, some bread and Vegemite for the week. And I kept on doing that until all of a sudden I ran out of books. I told you these stories aren't going to make me look good, by the way. I just want to remind you of that. So one day I'm standing in this bookshop wishing I had the money to buy this book, wishing that I could you know, read something that I wanted to read, and I realised that the owner of the bookstore had stepped out the back. And this was in a time, kids, if you can imagine this, before everything had an electronic tag on it. And so I, I picked up the book and I took a step towards the door. I took another step. I took another quiet step. And before I knew it, I was walking away with the book in my hand. I'd become a thief. And I took it down to the secondhand bookshop. I sold it and I went and bought some food. This is how I embarked on a crime spree. Whenever I ran out of money, I would go to a bookshop or a news agency and I, would, I got practiced at it. I'd put a book in here. I put a book up my sleeve and I would go out the door and I would crinkle it to make it look like it was secondhand and I would take it to the secondhand bookshop and sell it so I could go and buy some food. And I, I didn't think about it. 
I knew it was the wrong thing, but there was a part of me that just avoided thinking about it. Because if I, if I hadn't been caught, then it wasn't really happening. These were big companies, they can afford it. I needed to eat. That's how I justified it. Until the day when I put a book under my jacket and I felt a hand come down on my shoulder. And the owner of the bookshop said, please come with me. And he took me, sat me down at the back and he said, I'm going to call the police. And he called the police and the police came from the police station, which was 30 metres down the road. I, I didn't say I was a good thief or a smart one. So the policeman took me back. He sat me in a room. He took my confession, which I gave bitterly tears falling down my face. I'd been caught. And all of a sudden, all those consequences were crashing down on me. My parents would disown me. I, I might go to jail. I'd have a criminal conviction. Bitter regret. And so when I think about Peter experiencing that bitter regret, I think about that moment. Have you had a moment like that? Bitter regret when all of a sudden something caught up with you. And all of a sudden, you're weeping bitterly. But that's not the end of the story for Peter and Jesus, is it? And I'm going to go to John 21. I don't have this up on the screen, but I'm going to John 21. Because after Jesus has been crucified and has resurrected, Peter's out fishing and he sees Jesus on the side of the beach there cooking some fish. What does Peter do? He jumps out of the boat. He's in the water. He starts running towards the beach to get to Jesus as fast as he can. And in John 21, in verse 15, you can see that they eat a meal together. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And the parallels here between the three denials and the three affirmations are obvious. Three times Peter has denied Christ. Three times Jesus makes Peter reaffirm his love. Jesus is forgiving him, is redeeming him. And at the end of verse 19 there in, in John 21, we don't often look at it, Jesus says again to Peter, follow me. He repeats the call that he originally gave so many years before. He's betrayed Jesus, but Jesus has forgiven him. He says, follow me. And what's amazing, I think, is what happens to Peter after this. Is he still the brash, think about myself first disciple? No, he's transformed into a powerful speaker. He goes and preaches on the day of Pentecost. Thousands are baptised. He heals a, a lame man. He gets imprisoned and set free supernaturally. Peter becomes transformed by the forgiveness that he's received from Jesus. So there's a few elements in, in the story. There is sin. Peter betrays Jesus. There is forgiveness. Jesus forgives Peter and he accepts it. And then, of course, there's a transformation in Peter's life. This is the first story we're looking at. The second person we're looking at, the second story, Judas. And let me tell you, as hard as I tried... I can't find a photo or a picture or an artist's rendition of Judas that doesn't look like this somehow. You don't find anywhere he's happy and smiling and waving. He always looks sneaky. He's the dodgy brothers of the disciples, right? Put your hand up if you know anyone called Judas. What? <laughs> I'm shocked. Can you imagine being so reviled that 2,000 years later, your name is still avoided. So, Judas. Judas is a disciple, the same as Peter is. He's seen the same events, the same miracles. He's walked the same road as Peter has. 
And we're going to go back to Matthew 26 again. One day they're in a, in a believer's house in Bethany and there's this expensive ointment that is poured over Jesus' head. The disciples saw this and became angry. Why all this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold for a large amount and the money given to the poor. Then one of the 12 disciples, the one named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what will you give me if I betray Jesus to you? They counted out 30 silver coins and gave them to him. Judas betrays Jesus. Judas, uh, Jesus was still speaking when Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs and sent by the chief priests and the elders. The traitor had given the crowd a signal. The man I kiss is the one you want. Arrest him. Judas went straight to Jesus and said, Peace be with you, teacher, and kissed him. Judas has betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver, the, the cost of a slave, we, we say, the price of a man's life. But then something quite remarkable uh, happens. There are actually consequences to what Judas has done beyond what he expected. So have a look. Uh, when he gets charged and sent to Pilate in Matthew 27, verse 3, when Judas the traitor learned that Jesus had been condemned, he repented and took back the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. Did you know Judas repented of what he'd done? He felt that same bitterness. He obviously didn't expect Jesus to be condemned. And when Jesus is condemned, he's shocked. He's made a mistake. And he goes to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned by betraying an innocent man to death, he says to them. What do we care about that, they answered. That's your business. Judas threw the coins down in the temple and left. Then he went off and hanged himself. Let's look at our three points in this story. Is there a sin? Yes. Judas betrays Jesus in the same way that Peter has. Is there forgiveness? No. Who does Judas go to for forgiveness? The chief priests. Can they give him forgiveness for what he's done? No. Are they, are they able to take God's place and forgive him? No. Is he still carrying that burden? Yes. Is there any transformation? Not of a good kind. Now here's an important question for you. If Judas had gone to Jesus instead of the chief priests, if Judas had gone to Jesus and said, please forgive me, what do you think Jesus would have done? Put your hand up if you think Jesus would forgive him. Makes you think about what might have been, doesn't it? So here's the pointy end of the sermon. Those same three points apply to us as well. For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When we sin, we betray our Saviour. We don't like to admit it. But there are times in our lives when the way we act, the things we say, betray our Lord and Saviour. But we have a way open for forgiveness, don't we? Because of Jesus. But here's the problem. We try to accept forgiveness, but for some reason we don't always believe this verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Do we really believe it or are we perhaps sceptical about it? Do we hang on to our guilt? Because how on earth can anyone forgive that? And let me remind you, if you're thinking about the thing that you can't be forgiven for, 
you probably just put your hand up saying that Judas could be forgiven. Can you be forgiven? Put your hand up if you think you can. Yes, you can be forgiven. Years later, while visiting my hometown of Broken Hill, you wouldn't believe it, I was out with some friends and I ran into the girl from the pool party. It was amazing. And I, at the time, I kind of kicked myself because she was the duckling that turned into the swan. And a man, I was wishing that I'd let her catch me. But she's a lovely, lovely person. She's married, she's got kids. We caught up, it was really good. And I thought, here's my chance. I'm going to get this burden off my shoulders at last. And, and I went to her and I confessed and I told her all the, the, the weight I'd been carrying and I told her about that day and I said, oh, you must remember it. She's like, no. <laughs> Can you believe it? All this guilt I'd been bearing and she didn't even remember it. She said, oh, I, I forgive you, it's fine. Oh. I didn't feel like I deserved to be forgiven. You know, even after she said that, I still didn't, it was still there, it was still with me because I hadn't admitted it to God either. I hadn't asked God for that forgiveness too. Yeah, we should, we should, we should make amends where we can. But we also need to take that guilt, that stain that that sin has left on our hearts to God too. Because that can carry, if we carry regrets, if we carry those guilts, they will define us, they can change us. They can become an obsession even. But God has said, I can forgive you. I can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Let me tell you, just so you're not hanging as well, the policeman, after he'd taken my statement about my life of crime, left the room, left me sitting there for about 10 minutes I was in agony. It was the longest 10 minutes. It went on for eternity. And he came back in and he sat down and he said, I've spoken with the owner of the bookshop. I've explained your circumstance and they have decided to not press charges. You're free to go. And he gave me some, some cards for local places that could help me with food. And he walked me to the front door and he opened it and I stepped out into freedom. How do you think that felt? Do you think I went in and said, no, no, you've got to convict me because I feel guilty about it? Did I say that? No, I walked really quite quickly away in case they changed their mind. I was free. That's grace, right? Do you think I ever stole a book again? No, because that law was now in my heart. I was changed. I was transformed by the power of forgiveness. And that's what God offers for us as well. And really, that's, that's what the sermon is about, this transformation that God wants to make available for you too. Because I know there are some of you here who are carrying that stain, that burden, that weight on their hearts, who have been carrying it for a long, long time. And it's so heavy, it's almost unbearable. And you say to yourself, how can anyone forgive me of this if I can't forgive me of this? Let me share this verse with you to encourage you. 1 John 3, 19 to 20. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth. This is how we will be confident in God's presence. Not ashamed, not bearing our sin in front of God, confident in his presence. If our conscience condemns us, we know that God is greater than our conscience. And that he knows everything. I know the Holy Spirit convicts us in our hearts, but I know one who is greater than even our conscience, who says, I know you're carrying this on your conscience still, but it is forgiven. He is greater than our conscience. He knows everything about you already. He knows that stain you're carrying. He knows that guilt you bear. He knows the weight that slows you down in your life. He already knows about it and he is greater than even your conscience and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so that's my invitation today, to take God at his word, to believe that 
He will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. How can we believe that? How can we can trust that? Because of the cross, because of the price that was paid so that he could say that. The cross was a price paid for our guilt. Haven't you had enough of that weight around your neck? Haven't you had enough of it? Imagine if you could put it aside. Imagine if we could all lay that to rest. What kind of church could we be then? Do you think other people might notice that joy that we have? That we are walking lightly again? That we're not worrying in our faces? That all they see is freedom and, and righteousness that's come from God? And joy in his presence. No more bitterness, no more regret. Doesn't that sound good? Put your hand up if you'd like that today. I would too. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the cross, uh, for what Jesus has done for us. And the fact that you've declared that we can be purified of all unrighteousness. Help us, Lord, to trust you, to take you at your word, even when our conscience might say that we should hang on to those regrets. Help us to give them to you and be transformed by the precious blood of Christ today. And we ask this in his name. Amen.